Today's Survivor Podcast is brought to you by Reality Game Masters. The strategists of Survivor and Big Brother square off in the ultimate reality TV showdown. Find out more about our original web series at realitygamemasters.com. Coming to you live from my apartment, it's Rob Has a Podcast. And now, here's the guy who promises at no point to pee in anyone's rice or beans, Rob Sesternino. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Rob Has a Podcast. I am Rob Sesternino, and how the hell are you? Yes, here we are. It is time for another recap edition of Rob Has a Podcast, and we are going to be recapping episode number three of Survivor Caramoan, and we've got a great guest for you. She is the winner of Survivor Philippines, which we just saw last season. The one and only Denise Stapley will be joining us, and she's going to have a lot to tell us about her old buddy, Malk, who's on this season competing. And this is perfect timing to talk to Denise about what she thinks Malcolm is up to in this current game of Survivor Caramoan, colon, fans versus favorites, too. So we have been having a great week here on Rob Has a Podcast. We started the week off uh, in addition to doing our amazing race recap on Oscar night with Ryan and Abby. On Monday night, we tried to get together some people from Survivor Fans vs. Favorites 1, and I spoke with Kathy and Joel from Survivor Micronesia about what they think is going on here on these current fans tribe and then with Eric Reichenbach coming back and all that stuff and I had a very interesting conversation which has sort of shaped my opinion on how I feel about the current fans tribe and how I think that they need to work together or die alone to paraphrase uh, something that Jack Shepard once said because I think that the favorites are going to eat these guys up alive if they don't all get on the same page which is what happened in the first fans versus favorites Uh, Wednesday night we did after the live show of Survivor we talked with Stephen Fishback and had a great conversation on Survivor know-it-alls and a lot of people we got a lot of complaints I put the podcast up right before I went to bed and I actually made a mistake. Yes, it happens. It happens, folks. Ask Nicole. I posted the podcast with a, uh, a piece of the audio was missing in the middle. So when I woke up this morning and had a couple dozen messages from you guys, I was able to get everything fixed. So if you wanted to hear the Survivor Know-It-Alls, the corrected Survivor Know-It-Alls, you can listen to that at robhasawebsite.com. Or if you re-download it from iTunes or on Stitcher, you will have the current correct version of that show and then this morning I spoke with Hope and I thought we had a nice little chat also and we actually settled a bet that or not it wasn't a bet we didn't wager anything but a little bit of a debate but that Stephen Fishback and I had and I hate to say it but Stephen Fishback was right according to what Hope had to say so uh, it was not been a good week as far as me being right or getting anything right kudos to Stephen Fishback for having his finger on the pulse of the fans tribe so good work by Stephen Now, we're about to close the book here on February here for Rob Has a Podcast, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank you guys because it's going to be that February 2013 is the biggest month that we've ever had in the history of Rob Has a Website. So we had the most traffic ever that we've ever had on the website this month, and uh, thank you guys uh, so much. I really, really appreciate all of your support, and it's pretty amazing since... February is a month that only has 28 days, and there wasn't even a Survivor season until February 13th, so pretty impressive that this was our biggest month of all time, so thank you guys very much, and so that means tomorrow or Friday when you're listening to this is March 1st, and that means, as I promised, it is time for me to uh, put my money where my mouth is, and that's gross. You get that's a good way to get hepatitis, but I'm doing it anyway because I had said that I'm going to give 100% of the Amazon revenue that comes in over the next seven days to the Reality Rally and Michelle's place, and I'm a man of my word. So starting March 1st through March 7th, if you make a purchase through the links on Amazon on our website or 
if you go to robaswebsite.com slash Amazon, a percentage of the, whatever that the commission is that I'm going to get from Amazon, I'm giving 100% to the Reality Rally and Michelle's Place. So that's a uh, thank you to you guys for all of your support. And I really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to give some money to a good cause uh, because of this podcast. And that is always a nice thing to do. So March 1st to March 7th. And then uh, at the end of the week, I'll let you guys know uh, how much money we were able to raise for charity. And then the last thing, we've got a lot of shows going on right now. We've got show feeds going for every single one of the podcasts. If you're not subscribed to Rob Has a Podcast, but you'd like to be, make sure you go to robhasapodcast.com slash iTunes. Or if you only want to subscribe to certain shows, and right now we're covering Survivor, we're covering Amazing Race, we're covering Celebrity Apprentice, I'm going to be doing some uh, coverage on Big Brother Canada even. So you're going to want to get the show feeds. If you only care about one of these shows or two of these shows and you don't want to get the other stuff, you can subscribe to the individual show feeds at robhasawebsite.com slash show feeds. So now let's talk some Survivor. All right, so let's get into this. I have here with us on the line, it's not every day that I get to speak with the reigning Survivor champion, but here she is from Survivor Philippines, the one and only Denise Stapley. How are you? I'm doing great, Rob. How are you? I am doing fantastic as well. And Denise, I'm actually very much looking forward to this uh, chat that we're about to have. Me too. I'm definitely looking forward to being a little less stressed and having this conversation than right after, you know, days after the finale. So this is this should be good tonight. Yeah. Were you, were you just up all night that uh, the morning after the finale? We were. We were just wired. I mean, we went to bed late that night, and then you're up early and doing, you know, exit interviews. And so, yeah, I was wired and running on, you know, next to no sleep and a lot of caffeine. Okay. Well, good. Well, now you have, you've had a chance to exhale, a chance to get back to uh, normal. How is your post-survivor life treating you, Denise? It's treating me great. You know, it's it, it, I'm such a creature of habit, so coming back home and and truly, you know, to some, they might be, oh, my gosh, that's so boring. But it was great to just get back home and get back into work. And, you know, so the fun part now has just been kind of going random places and running into fans and just kind of seeing things unfold and some things coming up this spring with Reality Rally out in California. So gearing up for that. But post-Survivor life has been quite nice, quite pleasant. Now, as a Survivor winner who played in the winter season, is it almost like for you, does the new season come too quickly because... Play. I played two times in a even numbered season, so you have the big summer break. And I always imagined if you won the summer season, you have the whole the whole summer to go on like a victory lap. You know, you win in December, and then it's Christmas, and then it's New Year's. And now already new people are playing Survivor. When do you get to make your big victory lap, Denise? You know, I I don't need a big victory lap, truly. I mean, so so I had plenty of a victory lap just being there. I mean, I'm truly not one to really like you know, need tons and tons of limelight. So even just this little window, that was plenty. That was plenty. But <laughs> I'm really enjoying like watching the season and having a beer and being like relaxed watching. So I'm I'm good with it. I really <laughs> am. Maybe that's because you've never lost Survivor yet. If you if you had lost it once, then you would be really uh, look forward to that victory lap. I think, you know what, I think you're probably right. It's kind of like, you know, looking back and saying, you know, I, I've gotten that full Survivor experience literally from start to finish. And so it's kind of like, all right, I'm good. I'm really ready to take a breath. But I, I think you're probably exactly right. <laughs> all right, well, let's get into this. Now, I felt like we really, really timed this perfectly because I knew we wanted to talk to you this season. And then it was doubly great that, okay, now Malcolm is back, your buddy. He's back on the show this season. But we had an episode where even Malcolm is finding an immunity idol and he seems to have a new female counterpart in Corinne this season. So I feel like we have a lot of this dynamic to explore with you here. Totally. And I was so pumped to see that episode. So I cannot wait to talk about it. All right. Well, first off, let's talk about Malcolm, who you played with the entire game. You guys were together for 38 days. 38 days. Was that how long uh, you guys were together? 38 days. You got it. Yeah. 38 days together um, through, you know, 99.9% of the game. You guys were on the same page moving along. Is that is that correct? Am I uh, is that an overstatement? 
No, we were. We were right up until that end. Well, I was on the same page. We were we were floating down the same river, that's for sure. <laughs> um, I just didn't know how quickly maybe he may have wanted to veer off that river a little bit sooner than I did. Okay, but, we'll get, we'll but get no, into we all that. We were 99% of the way right on the mark with each other. Right, so you guys are together the whole way. So now you see Malk is back this season, and here, and here he is. How have you been feeling about uh, where Malcolm's lot in life has led him on Survivor Caramoan? You know, so far, I you know I'm liking where he's at right now. I think he's he's doing what he needs to do, but I'm also a little nervous for him. I'm a little afraid he's got a little PTSD left over from last season. Um, so I'm I'm hoping he makes some good choices with alliance and trust and um, kind of with Corinne and some other things going on. But so far, so good. And and last night, him finding that idol, oh my gosh, total happy dance. Like was so excited for him. So that's exactly what I wanted to see happen for him. I've been impressed with Malcolm too this season because I was really worried about him coming into the season because I do think that he's a great player, but I really felt like people were, would target him, especially after Russell Hance came back and then people didn't know who he was and they didn't vote him out and then they regretted that. But it seems like he has been adopted very much so into the core group of this favorites tribe. I completely agree. But, you know, I think that's part of just who he is. You know, socially, he is just an easygoing guy and so kind of I think he can kind of come in and even if people don't know him I mean just like with the Tan Bang tribe I mean he can kind of blend in and kind of make his connections and he doesn't initially seem threatening at all until you realize how incredibly smart he is and how much of a physical threat he is so I think right now he's doing it perfectly he's kind of hanging back letting all those kind of older returning players just kind of take the lead and I mean he's doing I think exactly what he needs to do right now yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, I think he's in a, a very good spot right now, except for uh, we know that Malcolm likes to make an alliance here with a very a strong-willed female on his tribe. And so now it, it seems to be a lot of, you know, going off and talking with Corinne, going out and looking for the idol. And apparently that's made them a target here of Andrea. So let's let's take it piece by piece. Let's start with the idol and finding the idol here. Now, you also found a hidden immunity idol with Malcolm on Survivor Philippines when you guys uh, found it on the top of the box of rice. But just like in this season, somehow every time Malcolm finds the idol with his female alliance partner, Malcolm always ends up keeping the idol. How come that is, Denise? You know, it really kind of sucks, but it, it is. It's like the same thing is happening all over again. But now we saw how well that worked out for him last season. So hopefully it will play out differently. But yeah, and it's his, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it, he finds it with the women, but now we have to see what happens. With me, it played out one way, but Corinne, I mean, she's, he is, is aligning with him. She has, I think, a few more cojones than me to push him about that idol. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. So, but yeah, I don't know what that deal is, but. Yeah, how come how come he gets to keep it? I mean, did you say to him when you guys it was right about right when you guys were about to split up and they had the so where you went over to Penner's tribe and he went over to Tandang? Uh, was there any sort of conversation like, well, hold on, let me I'll hold on to the idol and then I'll give it back to you at the merge? You know, there never was, never once did I push him on that idol. I mean, part of it, I think, initially when we found it, I think there was that giddy moment of like wishful thinking, like, oh my gosh, this is our idol. But, you know, I've watched Survivor from the beginning, and it's not our idol. There's only one person that can use that. And so I knew, you know, this is a smart guy. He is not going to give this up. He's, you know, strategic guy. And my best bet is just to stay aligned with him, stay pretty quiet, don't push too hard. You know, it's a lot easier to see what he's doing from behind the pack than in the front of the pack. And so I just kind of let him do his thing, but never once, never once did I really push him on it. I tested him. You know, we, they showed us, you know, that season – kind of with me kind of testing him, like, hey, what are the chances? And that was really not about me. You know, it would have been great if he would have said yes, but um, it was really more about me testing my alliance with him at that point in the game. So that was kind of my cue. So, but no, but I think Corinne, now Corinne, on the other hand, I think she will. I have no doubt. I think Corinne will push that or she will use that in a much different way than I did last season. Mm -hmm. Now, Denise, do you think there's any chance that Malcolm will leave the idol in his bag unattended at any point this season? (laughs) 
I don't think so. That thing's going to be tucked into crevices. You have no idea. There is no way he's going to let that thing get found. I didn't no think they, way. I didn't think they put it. It's like it was like they found the idol in the tree, and then it seemed like they just bury. They just like put it under a rock, like a foot away from the tree. It was like if somebody <laughs> found the idol without a clue, can't they find the the hid, the idol hidden again? You would think, you, you know, you would think, I would have just thought, just tuck it in your shorts, leave it there, but, you know, maybe he's a little gun shy of putting it in his bag, but I think he had buried it last season, too, you know, and then had, to, and it was only because of us merging that it was left in his bag, so I think, you know, even if it's like that two inches off the trail, it, yeah, he's, it's never going in his bag again. Yeah. Now, it must be an advantage for Malcolm at least to have had the hidden immunity idol in Survivor Philippines and knowing how to leverage it to a degree, which he certainly did last season, famously when Lisa was trying to out him about the hidden immunity idol and he bluffed his way through not using it. So for Malcolm, having the idol again here has to be an advantage for him. Completely, because he knows how to leverage that. I mean, and he and he did, like you said, you know, he did it very successfully, which ended up being a benefit not just for him but for me when when all of that went down, you know, last season. But I think he does. I think he knows. And now, you know, I think, you know, I was, you know, I get caught up, you know, just like all the other fans. I'm watching all the behind-the-scenes videos, and, you know, there was a recent video that I had just picked up and watched of him, and, you know, exactly. I mean, he's already thinking, you know, very differently this season and thinking about how he can use this not just with other players but really how to keep Corinne close in his alliance basically like blackmail Mm -hmm. you know now it's so he's kind of I think promoting it with her as our idol not because he has any intention because I don't think he has any intention of giving that idol to her at any point but more so as I've got this little carrot I'm dangling over you and you can't tell anybody about this or basically we're both in hot water. Okay, Denise. Now, you were not Malcolm's only female alliance last season. We also (laughs) remember that Malcolm had another alliance with a young lady who enjoyed the occasional cookie in Angie, and there was a lot of uh, snuggling going on back there at your camp in the early going. Now, let me ask you, is Corinne more of a Denise, or is Corinne more of an Angie in Malcolm's eyes, or... Is she the, ch- you got your chocolate in my peanut butter, now best of both worlds? Oh, I think I think Corinne you know, is more, I don't definitely more of an Angie on that end. It, she's not more of a me. I mean, just in terms of her age, um, you know, just physically, definitely on the Angie end. But I think could also be more of like a sister to him. I was definitely more of the mom. So there was definitely no snuggling. I mean, that was not, I mean, Angie and I were the polar you know, opposites in that realm up there. So I think either a mix or definitely on the Angie end of it. Because <laughs> I don't think Corinne's looking at Malcolm like a brother. Uh, no, I think Corinne's looking at, you know, this is some nice, this is, this is some nice scenery to keep around. So definitely <laughs> uh, there could be some canoodling at some point. Um, hopefully he will be smart and hopefully she will be smart and not do that. Because like you said, they already have a target on them just by, you know, spending, you know, having conversations that look intense. I mean, Malcolm and I never did that. I mean, we never spent significant time together at any point. It's kind of make your point and walk away. I mean, do you think that Malcolm learned his lesson from the flirtation or or whatever happened with Angie that he realized that that was a mistake to try to do that? I mean, this was in the very early going of his Survivor game. Uh, I think... I, I think in his mind he's learned that, and he's trying to be conscious of that. But in my mind, I go to, but he's a boy. Yeah. <laughs> and he's leading, you know, there, there are two parts of him that are leading him, and it's not always going to be his brain. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I'm hoping it's really his brain, and he keeps thinking logically through this season. And But, you know, that's you get swayed out there. And, and you know, and Karen, she's, she's a, you know, beautiful woman and you know here you're out you know again kind of like Cochran said you know you're surrounded by you know these beautiful women you know that are half naked um you know hey any young guy is gonna kind of have his his eyes tweaked by that so hopefully it doesn't blind him all right Denise now how about as a strategist I want to get your opinion on this so Andrea said hey look I don't like Corinne now I don't know if maybe 
Andrea saying, I don't like Corinne because I want to be the one going out into the forest looking for idols with Malcolm. But so for whatever reason, Andrea is distrustful of Corinne. There are nine people left in the favorites tribe. Do you like this uh, potential idea to say, hey, why don't we cut Corinne out at this point in the game? I, You know, I think eventually I think they have to look at that. I think that's a smart idea for Andrea eventually, but not now. I mean, right now you can look at there's other instability in their tribe. You know, you could look at Brandon, you know, before. I mean, even though Brandon's in that alliance, Brandon, or, you know, in it or wants to swap, I think she wants to swap him into that alliance. But he's so unstable or unpredictable. And, you know, there, you know, if you think of how, you know, Corinne has played before and you think of even, you know, what we're seeing in terms of confessionals or behind the scenes confessionals, so she's focused off on, you know, she knows how important you know, loyalty and that consistency is in the game. So even if they don't see her as completely loyal, she I think it's just a better strategy to keep her and, you know, pay attention to, you know, who else is just not showing that or is showing, you know, that they're just flipping and flopping all over. And that's Brandon. Yeah, it does seem like a mistake to try to say, hey, I for whatever reason, whatever your reason is, you want to take Corinne out of this equation and sub in Brandon Hans. Yeah, it do, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, in terms of long term, not at this point of the game. You know, eventually there may come a time and a place that that makes sense, but just not now. Okay, now Denise, this is a question that somebody had sent us on the uh, on our Facebook fan page, and I just thought it was a good question. I want to uh, get to it now. So. Uh, you are a uh, a licensed uh, mental health therapist. Is that is that fair? Am I getting that right? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, c- could you tell us a little bit about what is going on here with Brandon Hans? Because Cochran uh, did a little bit of an amateur diagnosis last week and said um, he's like a murderer in that he has <laughs> fits of rage, <laughs> followed very quickly by moments of unbelievable pleasantness. Can you tell us a little bit about what is going on with Brandon Hans? You know, I think he is just one of those people who he's just in conflict with himself. And Cochran put it perfectly. It's like he ebbs and flows from these moments of, you know, rage to, you know, yeah, pleasant conversation. Like, there are moments that I thought, oh, I, you know, I'd like to be there sitting having that conversation with Brandon. But he's just, there's this inner conflict. And I think, you know, part of that is he's young and still trying to figure out who he is. Part of that, you know, maybe that, you know, background and that history, but he's just got this inner conflict. And if he sticks around in the game, I have no doubt we're going to keep seeing that over and over, you know. And, and of course, we only see pockets of that, you know, with, with what's finally aired. But just this inner conflict um, that's just constantly there, a little bit of impulse control. Um, so lots of stuff going on with Brandon. Because didn't it seem like last night they were trying to give him all like good news, positive news, and he was just like having like an inner fit about what was going on, like threatening that he's w- thinking about all the things he's going to do if they're not telling him the truth? Well, there's that mistrust. He's always got that mistrust. You know, it was even like sitting there and having the conversation with with Philip, which was a horrible conversation, you know, the second episode with about him being, you know, middle management and then going back and and flipping out with the rest of the tribe. What, what he struggles with is he can't just take stuff and kind of process it slowly. He has to, like, you know, verbally, you know, puke it out there and, and just kind of throw it out there, and it, it just creates this kind of chaos around him. But, yeah, it's, it's it, they can people can soothe him. You know, we saw a coach try and do that, kind of soothe him the whole way through the season. You know, we're seeing kind of the whole tribe kind of try and do that, kind of keep him, give him, you know, good news and good information. But I think he just doesn't always trust it. So he gets insecure with that. And then he reacts. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I sort of thought was a parallel between this season and the Philippines as well was Malcolm's attitude towards Philip this season. And I felt like it's been similar so far to the way that he reacted at first to Russell Swan. Where if we saw in the interviews last week, Malcolm is like, "Oh boy, Philip. I mean, okay, I'll be, I'll go with the specialist here for a couple of days, and I'll do stealth RS. But I, if I have to do this for thirty nine days, I'm gonna hang myself." Basically, he said uh-huh. something to that to that effect. Do you think that that's a fair comparison? That is an absolutely fair comparison, and I watched that scene, and it was just painful to watch because I could just feel it. You could just see the look on his face was just like. 
oh my lord, okay, this is this is entertaining for now, you know, exactly, it's entertainment for now, but this just can't go on, because, you know, even, you know, I think, you know, and, and again, some of his early interviews, he talked about, you know, being that he wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he showed up, and first day on the beach, Philip Shepard is, you know, trying to just, you know, take this game and run with it, and that's what he's doing, so I think, Malcolm's doing what he needs to do and just kind of roll with it for now. But it's a very fair comparison. But if it go if it goes on too long, I, I'm not sure how that would unfold. You know, obviously with with Russell, um, he did the same thing. He kind of placated him and kind of just let him take the lead and did what he needed to do to to make sure that you know he stayed off of you know that radar with him. But it'll be interesting to see how this unfolds with him. Would Russell Swan have been more successful if he came up with a cool alliance name and nicknames for everybody? <laughs> no, that would not have, you know, maybe it would have. If he would have been happier at camp, maybe that would have been helpful. You know, if that would have kind of helped to kind of ease, you know, Russell's frustration out there, maybe that would have been helpful and, and we would have welcomed it. And we probably could have used, you know, a few nicknames and some humor at at camp, we had a lot of quiet days at that thing. You know, morale was really low. And, and so, you know, actually, maybe it would have been helpful. Who yeah. knows? Matt Sing R Us, maybe? Oh, Matt Sing R Us, Loserville. I'm not sure <laughs> what you would call us. I'm, I don't know what nicknames we would come up with. Those would be some. I, I, I might have to ask Philip. And actually, if I run into Philip, I might have to ask him what would be the nicknames he would have given for Matt Sing. Losers are us. Is that <laughs> losers? Losers are us. That might have been it. Uh, okay, so let's <laughs> let's transition into the fans a little bit. And now, somebody who I think also has gotten some comparisons to you this season is Sherry, and she's somebody who's been a very strong and vocal uh, female player this season. And her big one of her big storylines here has been her relationship with Shamar and trying to keep Shamar around for as long as possible in the game. I personally am starting to think that maybe this might be a fool's errand here. And I think that Sherry might be trying overthinking this a bit with trying to keep Shamar around. I'd love to know what's your take on the strategy of trying to keep Shamar around for as long as possible. Yeah, I completely agree with you because, you know, first of all, initially with Sherry, I wasn't I wasn't sure how impressed I was with her until then I started seeing her right, you know, initially doing that with Shamar and really kind of taking, you know, I mean, she's using that management, you know, she's, you know, she's in management and with, with the franchises, I mean, she's perfectly working, you know, with him, you know, basically like a problem employee and she's doing a great job with him. But, you know, and on the one hand, I, I praise her for that, and I think that's great. But right now, when it's still fans versus favorites, that's not a good plan, you know, in terms of what he's doing to the tribe. I mean, it is, it's creating chaos, again, chaos and the negativity. And, you know, coming from that thing, I, I, I remember what that was like to come back from challenges. And it wasn't that Russell was screaming at people. But it was just that, that heavy negativity that came back with us. And here's Shamar just blowing up. And so I think I think it's something that could, you know, not be a fantastic plan. It could have been a plan, you know, had he or if he does make it to the merge. But I don't know. Again, I don't know what's going to happen with that. But I don't think it's the wisest thing to just be kind of trying to keep him there because it affects the rest of her core alliance. Yeah, I give Sherry credit. I, I have to give Sherry credit. I think it was a good idea that, hey, Shamar, he's going to be my Philip, And I think it was worth a shot. But I think for Sherry, I think now it's, you know, there's no crime in adjusting your strategy midstream here. And if she, no. you know, I think for the good of this, because at some point, it's going to literally be the fans versus favorites, not just in the challenges, but when it comes to voting people out. And I think having this division is going, if Reynolds or Eddie are still in the game, come the time when there are fans around, those guys are going to jump ship and defect. And I think that the fans need to start to think about how are we going to function together as a unit against the favorites as opposed to uh, let's all go our own separate ways, which is what happened to the original fans on the first fans versus favorites and resulted in a big uh, margin of victory for the favorites in that game. Yeah. Well, and if you think of post-merge, if, if, you know, if you think of if there's a tribal merge and 
Cherry's still doing, depending on the lion test, when you're thinking that long-term game also, you know, if she somehow keeps Reynolds and, and Eddie, they become a bigger target than her, you know, in, after that merge for physical threats. I mean, it's, I don't know what it is. The, the testosterone gets thrown out there, and the men put bigger bullseyes on themselves. You know, Shamar is to be, Shamar is my Abby, you know, and so you, you get Shamar over there after that merge, and who knows? Somebody might say, you know what? We will keep them on, but we'll pull them from your alliance, and we'll keep them moved the right over the end. So, yeah, no, I think there's so many different ways, you know, that she could, she could go ahead and, and no, exactly, no doubt that if she's going to change, you know, kind of change her strategy now, it's really the time to do it. Well, she's got Eddie and Reynolds that aren't too far out of that. Now, you played, I'm glad you brought up Abby Maria because uh, you. <laughs> Abby Maria was somebody who uh, got on your nerves. Is that fair to say during your season? Oh, no. How could you tell? Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We loved each other out there. Abby, yeah. No, Abby and I, there was, in the game, there was clearly no love lost between us. We we were not the best of friends out there. And did Abby Maria ever put you on the no talking list? <laughs> No, she just kept talking. That was the problem. <laughs> I would have loved to have been put on the no talking list with Abby, especially the day that I was stuck out there with her for the entire day. That would have been a lovely no talk day. <laughs> um, you know, I go back to the parenting things where we, we play the quiet game in the car. I so wish we could have played that. Um, but no, we never did that. So to see Shamar do that, and he does it over and over, you know, or just telling people to shut up. I mean, he is, you know, here I have that experience of Abby feeling abrasive. I watch Shamar, and I just, it's just so abrasive. Yeah, and his blow-up after Tribal Council was almost like something that we would have seen last season uh, after the Tribal Council where Abby Maria said that everybody, it felt like everybody said that they hate her and she was a bad player, you know, that you have that same kind of outburst after a Tribal Council. Completely. And, you know, and he just goes off. You know, I remember, again, with Shamar before the game, you know, before the game started and once the cast came out, you know, there's the Occupy Wall Street video of him. And when you watch that at first, I thought, oh, how great, this guy's. But if you really watch it, he's just yelling over. And nobody's yelling back at him. He's yeah. just yelling. And it's the same thing, unfortunately, in the game, is he's just yelling. And, and unfortunately, you know, Reynolds keeps engaging with him. But other people are just quiet because I just don't want to engage with them anymore yeah I really wonder what is in this for the other players for the other fans besides Sherry we know what Sherry's up to but for these other players uh like Matt and Mike and Laura and Julia why are they sticking by this plan to keep Shamar around you know I think initially you know definitely for the numbers but now they've got to look at it the the, num- the numbers have now shifted and they don't have to, you know, they can do that swap. They can, they can slide, you know, or propose and, and make a deal or, you know, talk directly with, with Eddie or Reynolds and pull them into that. You know, they can swap those numbers, you know, and, and solidify something different without having to hang on to this negative baggage. Now, I got to ask you, uh, as a so occasional uh, sadist, uh, I would have to say, I am dying to see what will happen if we can somehow end up with Shamar and Brandon and Philip all, all on the same oh. beach. Oh, my gosh. You know, it would make good TV. <laughs> it would. <laughs> but, you know, I think, can you imagine being out there? I mean, it would just be chaos. It would be, I, I don't even know what would happen if the three of them would go at each other. Because they're, who? It would be crazy. It would be crazy. It would be entertaining. Yeah, it would be very entertaining. Going by what we uh, know about Sherry so far, if the fans go to Tribal Council again, do you think that they will indeed vote off Shamar and keep Eddie and Reynolds around, or do you think that they will lose either Eddie or Reynolds if they go to Tribal Council again? I think it depends on if if they can just step back. You know, we see the clip for or next week, and it looks like Eddie and Sherry. I think it's Eddie talking to, Sh- to Sherry. I'm not sure. I think it is, and she's kind of freaking out. And he's talking about strength. You know, keeping the strength in the tribe. You know, and unfortunately, if they think strength, Shamar does add strength at least in that last challenge. You know, in terms of just muscle mass. But you know, I I think they I'm hoping 
that they'll step back and think rationally, but what's, you know, in the best good of the tribe. And the best, you know, for the, the, the good of the tribe right now is to have a cohesive tribe. I mean, we saw that again last season with Tan Bang, which was, again, lucky for me, was they had enough time to have all those crafts and get, you know, gripey with each other. And so, you know, and they tried to present a very strong front, you know, when we first merged. And you could just see right through it. Like, there is a serious crack here, and I just have to wait time. And that's what's going to happen with the fans if they don't do some shifting now. So, now we've seen this with Tandang, an alliance or a tribe that, for whatever reason, was very dysfunctional, yet somehow was very functional when it came time when the bell rang in the challenges. They never, they seemed to always uh, be on the winning side, and they never had to go to tribal council until after the merge. Now, a tribe like that, which then fell apart once they got to the merge, because then people are defecting, people are I'm, I'm automatically there. Then they're trying to target themselves. So, is it better to lose a couple of people off the bat, like to get rid of the squeaky wheels before you get to a potential merge or a swap, or is it better to just uh, keep winning and uh, go in with as many people as you can and hope that you have the numbers advantage? I mean, uh, uh, you know, I'm not even sure. You know, I mean, I would hope that, you know, that on the one hand, it's like, that'd be perfect, you know, go in and just like same thing and not have lost us if you've had a cohesive tribe. You know, if you've had a cohesive tribe and you can get through and get through, you know, and not have to go to tribal council and you are on the right side of the numbers and you can maintain that, then great. But you're right. But then you have the people. But if you do that, then you still come in with people like Shamar or Brandon, who even if you've had plans or alliances, they're just so unpredictable that that can still get upset. So I don't know. I think I think it can work to an advantage either way, you know, or, you know, I mean, you know, luckily, you know, you could say, well, was it, you know, beneficial, you know, for Matt Singh to go to every tribal council and basically have our tribe decimated? Well, for me, in the end, it worked out well, mm-hmm. um, but I don't know that the rest of the tribe would say that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I so. do think you're better off with a tight five than a not tight seven because yeah. I really think in the numbers game, your tight five will vote together. Whereas if you have a t- you know uh, a tight five and then two people who are on the outs who are going to defect. I mean, basically, in the numbers game, if those two people are turning into two votes for the other side, your five is essentially a three because you have votes canceling out some of your votes because they're not doing what you want. So, I, you know, I hate to say you should throw challenges, but if you have a tight group, you are better off to lose some of the dead weight or the people that you're not getting along with because they will be problems for you when there are other people they could side with. That's true. And so when you have that bigger tribe that works, you know, with Matt Singh, unfortunately, you only started, you know, last season, we only started with the six. So there wasn't much fat to trim off. Um, but you're right. I think, you know, you, 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 there's less moving parts in that smaller core group. I mean, there's, it's easier to manage. Um, and you're right, less of a chance that somebody's going to just, you know, find, find a better deal. So what happens here? At some point, you would imagine that they're going to mix these tribes up. Maybe, if not this episode, then the one after that. And you were somehow, which I still think is uh, one one of the more um, amazing things that you did last season. Of how they didn't vote you out when you got to, when you got over with uh, Penner and Kent over there when they went to tribal council. How did you? What is your trick to ingratiating yourself uh, to a new group like that? You know, I wish I wish I knew and could kind of bottle it somehow. But you know, I I remember just being out there, and when I when I got you know one, I was just so thankful, truly, to be with Calabao. So I mean, part of it was just I think hopefully they just saw this genuine like I was just so excited to to be with them. But I started working that right away. You know, just you know, again, it was kind of like with Malcolm. I I don't tend to be again. You know, I, I I swim with the masters. You know, swim team, and I never I hate to lead practices. I'll follow because I can follow really good and I can pay attention. I can pace better. And it's similar in the game. And so it was easier for me to go into Calabar, just kind of watch what's going on. And, you know, and I just, and part of it was just, like you said, ingratiating myself and getting to know every single member of the tribe, you know, getting to, you know, talk with Dawson and getting to talk with Katie and, and Carter and, and, you know, and finding some way to connect with them, you know, just, just, 
you know, to kind of neutralize myself a little bit. And then I just knew I had to perform at challenges. So I had to figure out that way to make sure that they saw me as valuable enough, but not, you know, just not threatening. So it's, it's a, it was a mix, but you know, that social piece of just being able to go and kind of just dive in and get to know them and genuinely, and luckily, you know, for me, that's, it's a genuine desire. I really, you know, being out there, you know, yes, I know it was a game, but you know, I love building those relationships. And so thankful for me, you know, it, it worked. But, you know, I think another part of that, you know, in this conversation we're having about, you know, what is better to be, you know, have dead weight or to just be a smaller, tighter group. Had Calabaw gone to tribal councils before and gotten rid of a Dawson or, uh, so, you know, somebody else who may not have been fitting in as well over there? It was almost like, well, it's like uh, they had people who were expendable, who were, you know, for whatever reason that... Penner and Kent felt like we're on the outs. And so it was like, okay, well, let's get rid of some of these people that we've been wanting to get rid of. We've been itching to get rid of, as opposed to Denise, who, you know, we don't, she, you know, she hasn't been annoying us here for 12, 13 days. And so it was like a, you know, they had, they were itching to vote somebody off too. Like that's the total perk. I mean, it is. I mean, it, and again, the same thing with, you know, when, when we, when we merge, Pandang was, itching to get our C. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's it's that same thing. It's like I could come in and kind of find kind of this middle groove, you know, where I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a threat, but I wasn't the dead weight. And they they already had their time to kind of see, you know, who was really helping around camp. I mean, you've been out there, so you know, you know, it's like it it matters. You know, if you're working around camp, if you're putting in effort, you know, people pay attention to that. They watch that and and that's currency out there. And so, yeah, you bet. If they had gone to tri- no, so if they had already gone to tribal council and trimmed off some of that fat, mm-hmm. uh, I definitely wouldn't have been as safe. You know, had Dana not already, you know, had Dana not gotten sick, I think I would have been sitting in a very different position. You know, because that trimmed off. You know, I mean, all of a sudden now they were down numbers and somebody that they thought would have been a good competitor. And you know, lucky for me, you know, Katie hadn't performed, you know, fantastically in challenges, and and Dawson had struggled in some challenges. So I was able to come in there and say, hey, you know, basically, here's what I can offer. Yeah. No, there was some some sort of, you know, magical brilliance around that you guys just kept losing because the other teams had times, <laughs> had you know, the other tribes had time to get sick of each other. And it's, so, it's sort of by the time you guys got to where you needed to be, everybody, they all were like, we have all these other people we want to get rid of. And we'll forget about these two, <laughs> you know, they're oh, fine. I, I so wish I could say it was magical brilliance. But again, what was that name we thought that Philip might give us? Like, losers are us? No, we just kept losing, you know. You know, there was yeah, there was no strat. But you're right; it, there was definitely no intentional losing and no strategy in it. But yeah. it brilliantly turned out very uh, counterintuitive. In my favor. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, Denise, we have so many, especially when we have somebody who's just off the show. I- I'd like to g- jump into our questions here so we can sort of get your take on different things that our listeners want to know. And also we can uh, dive into some of the questions from Philippines that people still have from last season. Of course, these questions come to us from our Facebook page, which you go to at facebook.com slash Rob has a podcast. So uh, here we go. Let's uh, jump around a little bit. And uh, Kurt with a K wants to know, could you give us a quick 30-second psych evaluation of Philip in the same fashion as you did for Zane last season? All right, can you, uh, can you give us Philip in 30 oh seconds? Oh, my gosh. You know, I can't. You know, all I th- I'm thinking about is my DSM, you know, at work, and, and I have to go, like, mental disorder not otherwise specified because I don't know. <laughs> Because he's such a, he's got such a flavor of so many different things. I mean, he's a little eccentric. He could be completely sane and just quirky. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I was hoping you could give us a little bit more, Denise. Uh, you know, I would need some assessments. <laughs> I mean, truly, Philip. Philip is one of those people where I can't. I just. I mean, I honestly, as a therapist, I can't figure him out. Because he's a little histrionic, you know, and kind of how he talks, and you know, I kind of go, okay, is he is he truly is he delusional? Is he is it, like in one scene it looks like he was seeing Brenda lifting a rock, and then all of a sudden he's talking about lifting a rock, and he's having these conversations about basketball shots that are just quirky, and 
whether or not it's diagnosable, I don't know. <laughs> but I would need a whole lot more time. I, mean, I, I, I would love to sit down with Philip just to talk with him and try and figure that out a little bit. Like, how sane is he? Uh, I don't know. Well, you know, it's it's a it's a great question because I've had lots of conversations with the guy, and you say, "Oh, he's very that seems very sane." Um, so it's hard to tell. What what do you believe? What you see on TV or what you see in real life, or uh, is it some combination of the two? Who knows? And and what gets amplified out there? I mean, I think he's sane. He's just really. I mean, I don't think he's like he's because he's stable, but he's just quirky. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Mike Skull wants to know, will anyone else ever match your record of attending every tribal council in a season? Now, that's pretty amazing. It really is. Uh, it is a, a testament to you, first of all, of being able to survive every tribal council, but it's got to be a, a real statistical anomaly. Can anybody else ever do this again? Well, I'm sure they could, but are they going to want to? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, because it's it's one of those records that if you're trying to go for that, and you don't make it to the end, your title changes dramatically because then you become the loser who went to almost every tribal council and then got voted out, you know, or got stuck going to everyone. So, yeah, I, you know, I, it, it'd be a great season to see somebody else do that. I would love to see that. But you know, hopefully maybe I'll, I'll hold that title for a little while longer. Okay. Now, here's a question that I got from a lot of people in different variations. Let me read this one from Mike Scarlett. He wants to know, why didn't Denise lock up final two or final three deal with Malcolm far earlier than day 38 if she was willing to go to the end with him, despite the fact that he was the likely favorite to beat everyone? It seemed to be the lone yet major flaw in an otherwise stellar uh, social slash strategic game. So basically, a lot of people want to know, you know, we were all very impressed with when you uh, came out of the woodwork to say, hey, Scoopin, let's, let's get rid of Malcolm. Uh, and he said, okay, that's great. Let's do that. And ended up with you in the final three and ultimately winning the game. But a lot of people wondered, why did it take after, at least from what we saw on the TV show, you to have that conversation with Malcolm and where he was very noncommittal, which really got you to sort of turn your back on him? You know, that it's, it's a great question. And, you know, the, absolutely right. I probably should have pushed a little bit harder sooner. But even from the very first conversation that I had with Malcolm, in hindsight now, you know, I should have heard it right then because I had asked him when we first made our alliance, you know, have you thought long term? And he's like, well, not that far, but it's you and I basically for now. And I should have heard that. And we never locked that down. But because we had been through so much with Matt saying, and because we'd come, you know, back into that merge and everything was going consistently and, and votes were going the way that, you know, that in my mind I wanted them to go, whether or not it looked like I was, you know, following his vote or somebody else's vote or leading a vote, um, everything was going smoothly. And so it really wasn't until, you know, that final four, because we had that final four deal. And I should have been thinking that. I mean, I truly should have. And that's hindsight. You know, I, I Again, lucky for me that I was able to, you know, not only talk with Lisa and Mike, but that they were already thinking that also. But, you know, had I had that conversation with them, quite honestly, even if I had pushed him on that, though, I don't think he would have taken me to the end. Actually, I know he would not have taken me to the end. Um, so it could have, what it could have ended up doing is creating more chaos for me with, with, Mike and Lisa or, or somebody even earlier to seem more as a threat. Like, wait a minute, maybe Denise is even much more strategic than I think, and she's not just kind of riding along with me. So again, I just chose to kind of hang back a little bit. I thought my alliance was strong with him, and it was only when it got to those four, you know, that final four, that I really saw, wow, I'm, I'm in danger here. So really, quite honestly, I missed it, and I, I should have, in hindsight, you know, I should have pushed him a little bit more on the one hand, but who knows? It could have backfired, too. Well, let me ask you the other side of that question, where I felt like Malcolm had a golden opportunity to get rid of you uh, at the point when it was the final five, and then he, you were saying, hey, Malcolm, uh, why don't you give me the, you know, you won the immunity necklace, why don't you give me the hidden immunity idol? And he's like, nah, I want to hold on, I didn't want to hold on to it. And you didn't really uh, push him there either. And I said, oh, my God, Malcolm is going to do in Denise right here. But yet he did not. But had he, uh, and he probably wins the game, 
uh, you would think if he can do that, unless, uh, you know, there's a, actually, I'm going to ask a follow up question after this, but let's say Malcolm had voted you out at the final five. Would you have voted uh, for Malcolm if he was in the end with Lisa and Scoopin uh, at that point? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, he would have had my vote, um, you know, and with respect. I mean, either way. Yeah, he would have had my vote had he voted me out. <laughs> so that's never, there would have never been a question in that. And I had never necessarily, I had never told him that. Um, he had never told me that I had his vote. I think I anticipated and hoped that because of our history there. But that was one of the things in talking with Michael and trying to convince him, you know, that he, I know, asked at one point and said, you know, basically, are you, would you give Malcolm your vote? And I said, well, yeah, you know, basically, I'm going to tell him that because I need him to know that if I'm sitting on that jury, I'm not giving Mike my vote. But when he asked me if, if Malcolm had guaranteed me his vote, I said, no. So, you know, it, 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 either way, you know, either way, you know, again, it worked out okay for me in the end, but I would have definitely given him my vote. And then the follow-up to that is in this hypothetical situation, which are always so much fun. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what if, what if, what yeah, if, what, what if, what if, what if, uh, so <laughs> if, if some buts, uh, so if, Malcolm votes you out at final five. Okay, now so now the final four is Malcolm, Abby, Maria, and then Scoopin and Lisa. Do Scoopin and Lisa cut Malcolm there at four and go to the end with Abby Maria, or would they stick to their word with Malcolm? You know, I think it it, it depends because I think Lisa and and Michael would probably argue back and forth about that. Lisa, I think, you know, had, you know, that strategic, you know, she, I remember, you know, seeing, you know, and watching, you know, conversations with her about Malcolm, you know, and seeing him as a threat. So I think Lisa would have been more inclined to push to take Abby. Mike, on the other hand, you know, Mike, on the other hand, he's just, he is a diehard competitor. You know, I love him to death. You know, he's a, he's a diehard competitor. And it's kind of like the, you know, I want to run with the best. And so I think he would have pushed Lisa, you know, to keep Malcolm just because then if he won, he would have kind of in his mind, you know, beat the best. So, you know, I think the smart move would be for them, obviously, to take Abby, even though that's clearly not the kind of game that I wanted to play. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and sitting here from this, definitely, if I were them um, and wanting to win it, and if they hadn't made that deal with Malcolm, you know, definitely I could see them taking Abby. Okay, and then let me ask a third question in this hypothetical. All right, let's say then they vote out Malcolm at the final four. And the final three of Survivor Philippines is now Lisa, Scoopin, and Abby Maria. Who is the winner of Survivor Philippines with you and Malcolm out of the mix? Oh, God. Well, Malcolm and I are probably not going to vote along the same party lines on this one. Okay. Because we're probably going to split votes. You know, I, and who knows, we may have conversations, you know, and figure that out. But, you know, I could see, because I just, I don't see Malcolm voting for Abby. Mm-hmm. Um, I, or at least I don't want to see that. <laughs> but I think, you know, honestly, I think he would probably vote for Lisa over Mike. And I probably would have voted for Mike. And part of that, you know, you, again, you can look at, you know, that combination of strategy and relationships in the game, you know, all those, com- you know, I just, I had a stronger relationship with, with Mike in the game than, you know, I had strong relationships with both Lisa and Mike, but in terms of that voting, I probably would have given my vote to Mike. Definitely not, obviously, to Abby. So who wins? Who does Penner vote for? Who's, who's who voting for Penner? Penner? Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and what's his speech? I don't know. <laughs> Penner, you know what? I could see Penner, you know, or he, I, could, I could almost see Penner voting for Abby. <laughs> I could. I could see Penner voting for Abby. Almost like a shame on you. She made it good for her. You know, she, you know, the bull in the china shop, she made it to the end. And, you know, and there were moments out there when I thought if she makes it to the end, you know, depending on who's sitting on, you know, the other side of her, I might, you know, I, I almost cringed at it, but, you know, that I might give her my vote because <laughs> if she was able to be that bull in the china shop and get there, then kudos <laughs> to her. But clearly, you know, in the game, I can say that now, in the game, you know, I, I don't know that I could have done that. I would have had to have given my vote to one of the others. Yeah, and you figure she's got Pete's vote. She's got Artis's vote. If she could get, you know, if she got a Penner vote... <laughs> 
she's, she's only one. It. She's exactly. Got... It doesn't take it doesn't doesn't take that much to, to, to <laughs> split you know split that vote three ways. Oh, that would, that would have been funny. That would have uh, been funny. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I could have taken it. And keep in mind, now, I and I have to say now, keep in mind, Abby and I are all good right now. I just need to make sure that. Like, Abby and I are all good. So when she hears this, she knows we are all good. Well, I think she has a pretty good sense of humor about everything. I mean, I know you guys couldn't uh, get along with her on the island, but everything I've ever heard her say post-game uh, has seemed to be uh, very fun and very, uh, you know, lighthearted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, think she's lear- I think she's learned to kind of poke fun at herself, and she has the... You know, she she has the capability of insight, and and she's used that. So yeah, so we've been able to you know kind of poke fun and talk about like, you know, God, were we on our period for thirty nine days, or knee hurt, or you know what was going on? That wow, it was just you know owly out there. But so no, yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. She's been able to kind of laugh at it, and we've all been able to kind of kind of just lighten it up quite a bit more. Okay, Matt Borowski wants to know, we have learned about the existence of the BR rules this season. What would you say are the DS rules? Are there DS rules that you would <laughs> that you would give out oh, to people? Make nice with everybody. That's I mean, I it, my rules are not going to be quite as, you know, I I you know, I love hearing, you know, Philip talk about the the BR rules. But you know, there there's benefit, you know, the DS rules. There's benefit to riding the rails in the middle you know, and playing a quiet but strategic game. You know, there's, and, you know, some people love it, some people hate it, but there's huge benefit in that early on. So just, you know, and just even though it's a game, DS rules make those relationships. You've got to build those relationships in the game. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a good one. I think that's good. Uh, and, and, but it's almost like the opposite of the Boston Rob rules of the make an alliance, make an alliance within the alliance. Uh, it's just like uh, just <laughs> just and then uh, cut just, them all out. Yeah, don't get don't get voted out. You just be the last be the last people in your tribe, and then uh, go <laughs> go to another tribe. Be the last people in that tribe, and then uh, <laughs> go to the end. Which isn't that just common sense? Like that that just kind of you know I, I heard that and I kind of chuckled. I thought, well, yep, that that makes sense. That's kind of the goal of the whole game. Yeah, is just be the last one standing. <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, here's a question from John Radich, and he wants to know, how would Denise compare herself to Dawn? I feel like they are very similar and would like to hear her thoughts. Now, I don't know. I, I kind of see uh, you and Dawn as uh, different kinds of people, but I'd love to hear uh, your take on uh, another woman this season, Dawn. You know, I think, you know, if, if, if for example, if I, if I were out there this season with Dawn, Dawn would definitely have been somebody I would have aligned with. And would have identified with from from a professional standpoint and a mom standpoint. In terms of our tolerance of the game, I think we're very different. Um, you know, Don. You know, and we've already seen it a little bit of kind of that that kind of ebb and flow emotionally. And you know, I'm I'm just waiting for her to kind of again, you know, kind of be able to kind of show show that strength in some of those challenges. But in terms of emotionally, our our emotional ability is is totally different. You know, that was one thing that I really, you know, was a huge benefit for me in the game was just being able to stay steady, just steady, no breakdowns, you know, never once did I have one of those kind of on the beach, hey, I need to go home, this is horrible. It's like, nope, this is a game. Um, Feelings get hurt, life goes on. Um, So that's very different. But I think in terms of our motivation and from the relational standpoint, Don and I are very similar. You know, because she's she's out there and she is building relationships. I mean, you could see her in her relationship with Cochran right now, um, and kind of that loyalty piece with Don. You know, I, you know Don and and Cochran. You know, very a very loyal alliance. Um, you know, I think, and a lot of people see Cochran differently. But so a lot of similarities between Don, but definitely from the emotional standpoint, pretty different. Let me submit a mathematical equation to you. You tell me if you uh, if this checks out or not. Denise <laughs> Stapley plus Lisa Welchel equals Dawn. Oh yeah, that could be an interesting. <laughs> that 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 seems like a fair be, that that's a fair example. Yeah. Um, but you can see that. I mean, but that's you know. So if we were paired up together, it turns out okay. You know, Lisa and I, great friends in the game great allies in the game at the end, you know, or kind of in the way that it, it played out. 
Um, but yeah, that would be a fair mix from that emotional, kind of that emotional standpoint um, of, of both of us. So yeah, good comparison. Now, is it true that you and not Penner were actually the one that identified Lisa Welchel as Blair from the Facts of Life? I was. And I had basically, I mean, I knew her the minute I saw her. I mean, I grew up watching the Facts of Life, you know, and Punky Brewster and all those shows. And it was in the mud challenge. I mean, we were in the middle of, you know, the mud challenge, you know, when Lisa was, you know, pounced on me. I mean, we had plenty of time to talk, you know, and kind of chit chat and not, chit, but, you know, some strategizing with her. So I, you know, whispered to her and said, does anybody else know who you are? And at that point, she had told me no, and I'd like to play as long as I can, you know, without that. And so basically, I was already kind of planting a seed of, I can be an ally for you, I'm not going to out you. But then, of course, when I go to Calabao, you know, it was, it became a, a negotiation, or, you know, kind of a, not a negotiation, but a, 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 a piece for me to use with Penner to kind of bring him a little bit of information and say, hey, do you know who this is? I think he had, I'm pretty sure that he knew to some extent who she was, that she was an actor. He, I, I'm almost positive he had some background on her. But at least when I shared that information with him, he played it off as if he did not know who she was. Um, but I think Mike had already known who she was, but none of the other players knew knew that she was an actress or knew who she was. Did that come up at all in the famous scene where she finds the hidden immunity idol in the bag and she's sort of like, hey, I'm not going to tell any anybody your secret. Don't worry. Things are safe with me. And then, do you, I mean, do you say to her, it's like, all right, uh, you keep your mouth shut or I'm telling everybody that you're Blair. You know, I didn't. I didn't. And I completely let, at that point, you know, I just knew let Malcolm handle it because he already had a relationship with her, you know, and he, you know, she had, you know, she's just someone that, you know, she had such a guilty conscience about that initially. I mean, she truly didn't mean to find it. And so her reaction was really genuine, like, I'm really sorry. Um, so there's a little bit of self-guilt already that was controlling this. So I didn't really need to step in and do it. And it really wasn't, wouldn't, I don't know how beneficial it would have been for me because really Malcolm's the one that had the leverage. Okay. Uh, now, did, did you have a million questions for her that you wanted to ask her? Like, did you ever, you guys, when it was just you two, did you ever ask her facts of life questions? You know, I didn't. We talked a little bit about the show when we were out there. But really, you know, when you get out there, you know, there's so much more to her life, you know, than just that time period of her life. And so I really just enjoyed getting to know her out no, there. Denise, I'm not buying this. I'm not buying mm-hmm. this. You only have there. You're so bored out there. You have nothing to talk about. You knew you watched the show. You're you're telling me all this time you never once had any facts of life questions that you were dying to know from Lisa Welchel. You know, the only question I think I ever asked her when when we were out there was if she kept in touch with any of them. I just didn't. You know, I mean, and I watched it. You know, I watched when George Clooney was on there. I mean, I loved the show. But again, you know, one, because, you know, it, it wasn't something I would have wanted to have brought up, you know, around camp because nobody else knew who she was. So it's not like I could sit there and say, hey, Lisa, you know, or start singing, you know, or humming the Facts of Life song. <laughs> um, but, you know, and plus, had I done that or even kind of done that, it could have made her feel insecure about kind of how aligned I was with her or how consistent I would be with her. And so even if any of those questions popped in, you know, I just... You know, I really just wanted to know, you know, about her and her life now. Okay. Well, you have more willpower than I do. I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> I would... I, I've had to learn that in my practice. You got to have some willpower, and you can't always just you got you got to filter the thoughts a I'm little too bit. Too curious. I'm too curious. Uh, okay. Well, uh, speaking of your your profession, uh, Chris Devine wants to know: uh, Would you be willing to counsel Robin Nicole for a podcast therapy session? Would if if my marriage was ever on the brink, Denise, would you be would you be willing to step in either on or off the air and save my marriage? A, I think your marriage is probably just fine. But B, yeah, yeah. If you need a little therapy, just like with Malcolm, I told him I I would provide a little free beer fueled uh, therapy, um, <laughs> which is you know probably just a little unethical. But if you need a little help or a few few suggestions, we'll we'll get you in the right path. But I think you're doing just fine. Okay, well I will. Uh, I'll be joined by Nicole in a little bit, so we'll ask her uh, if she, if she's on board for this. <laughs> Uh, Patrick Redker wants to know, would you ever join Rob and Nicole for a uh, Rob has a podcast or Rob has a love cast? Would you ever do a podcast where we can take uh, relationship questions from our listeners for you to answer? 
Oh, that would be a blast. That'd be awesome. Of course I would. Okay, That'd good. be very cool. Good. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if they, if, uh, that, you know, that was too, too much, uh, tomfoolery for you. I wasn't sure if it was, uh, yeah, you know, sometimes I need to loose it up a little bit. You're a, you're a serious, uh, professional. I don't want to, you know, this is nonsense. I, you know, but sometimes, you know, it's, it, it, but that stuff, you know, the, there's merit to it. Like the stuff like that, like the little podcast or the relationship questions, you know, like, yeah, there's some merit to that. And it's fun. You no, people, fun and that. people really need <laughs> that. People have been asking for this for a long time. People have a lot of questions. You could really help some listeners. Well, we will just have to talk. We'll have to talk and figure out how we could do that. I'd have to have, I'm, I'm trying to think, I'd have to have some limits on that. I don't know, because there's, there's only so much you can answer over the air, but, but, there, but there's a lot of good stuff out there, a okay. lot of good tips. Yeah, they could, they could use some advice, some of the listeners. I, I, but, you know, I prefer that all the listeners are single, because now once they, they start dating, they're going out, they're not listening to podcasts, they're not talking to me anymore. So I, I, I prefer all of our listeners to remain single for as long as possible. Perfect. So maybe you don't want me to do that podcast because <laughs> okay. then that might change things. Might, might hurt, hurt our downloads. It might hurt business, exactly. <laughs> so maybe we need to rethink that. Okay, here's from Jason Lee. He wants to know, as a therapist, how would you console someone through the humiliation of being voted out first twice? Now, have you been contacted by Francesca, Denise? I have not. <laughs> have but you, you know reached what? out to yeah, Francesca? No, I have not. <laughs> it, but with her, you know, I think luckily, I think Francesca, you know, somebody like that coming back in, if you've been voted out first and you're being asked back, I have no doubt that, you know, she took time and you know, she's a smart woman and processed through and knew that that could be a possibility, you know, and would she be okay with that? Um, but, you know, that, it could be a little crushing, you know, I mean, you have to have a pretty strong ego to be able to withstand that. And, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, I, I think, you know, when I've heard her in her exit interviews with, with you and, you know, in, in other interviews, you know, she, she seems to be doing just fine with it. Like she kind of let it go and she's kind of, kind of moved on. Okay. Uh, who do you think uh, had, <laughs> who do you think had it worse, Francesca or Russell Swan? Are you serious? Like, Russell was very think? upset. Oh, I, I think Russell, Russell by and far struggled. But again, think of that totally different experiences in the game. You know, Francesca went out first the last time, first again. Um, Russell had a very, had such a different experience, you know, his, his first time out, you know, and his tribe was more successful. And so he had just never experienced what he probably felt like was this ultimate humiliation. And again, this is somebody who is incredibly competitive um, and so this is, it's like this huge ego crushing blow. And I, I think it's probably going to take a little while longer for that wound to heal up for him. Okay. Annie Chen wants to know, you drew a lot of attention to yourself at a couple of tribal councils when you called out Abby for being a nuisance to say the least. Was she really so bad that you couldn't keep it in? And was there anything more to it? Was there anything that Abby was doing that really got on your nerves that we didn't see on the show? Oh, you know, it, it, it was complete. I mean, it, it, I can't even describe it. It was just her attitude in, in the game, it was just her attitude and the way she would talk to people or, you know, argue with people and, you know, not help around camp. And just, I mean, it was just a combination of factors, but, you know, in hindsight now when watching Shamar, oh man, I would, I, I don't know what kind of stuff I would have said, you know, had Shamar been on my season. So, you know, with Abby, at least I was able to try and bite my tongue and, you know, I didn't have to live with her for the first 18 days. The rest of Tandang did. So I only got the taste of her at that tail, you know, towards that tail end. And yeah, no, I, nuisance, frustrating. It's not cultural. <laughs> well, some it's of the people seem to, some of the people seem to like her though, uh, that Pete and artists, at least they seem to uh, like Abby Maria through most of the game. They did. Well, and, well, and Pete needed, I mean, Pete was, Pete and Abby, I mean, he had to stay connected with her, and he realized it too late that he had stuck it out, you know, kind of like with Sherry. You know, he'd stuck it out with someone who was just this negative at the time, this, you know, negative spot in the tribe that was just fueling, you know, frustration. And, you know, he realized too late, but you're right. It, but but they also did get along, and, and they and they can banter you know, and get along and, 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 you know, artists, I think, you know, got along with her 
fine when they were out there. Um, but yeah, no. So some people got along fine with her. Um, I, our personalities just, you know, we're strong, you know, both very strong minded women. Um, and that kind of gets, you know, gets me fired up. It gets her fired up and, you know, and I respect her for that, but yeah, in the game, holy moly craziness. Now, Denise, you are a uh, a therapist, and you help people who are going through a uh, very hard time. So, I want to know. There's a lot of contentiousness in your season. I, w- I want to give you a couple of people. You tell me if you would be able to ever, if you think there's any chance of you being able to help these people uh, get through their hard times. Okay. Sure. All right. Uh, is there any hope for any reconciliation between artists and Mike Scoopin? Never happening. <laughs> What are they even fighting happening. about, Denise? That would be that would be like the couple that comes to therapy with me, and I have a lot of couples. You know, I have a lot of couples that I work with, and but every once in a while, you there's a couple that it's just <laughs> it's almost unethical to keep counseling them because it's just not going to change, and you know, and I can't really comment because I yeah, on on too much, but they both have their own stances on it. But <laughs> that is a bridge that I don't see being ever crossed. Okay, what what about our reigning Miss Survivor, R.C., and Abby Maria? Is there any hope for them that one, one day they could be uh, arm-in-arm arm standing as the, the former women of Tandang? I, do they have to be arm-in-arm, arm, or can they just be standing next to each other? <laughs> standing next, I, standing next I, to each I, other. I, 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 do think, I think there's hope for, for both R.C. And, and Abby Maria. I, I think definitely, you know, and just going through kind of the – the you know the Miss Survivor the rating Miss Survivor piece you know was good for them and kind of created kind of a little banter you know so I hope you know that down the road maybe their paths will cross and you know they'll have some time to just kind of you know hash things out I think I think it's easier for for Abby to kind of having hash something out and then kind of let it go RC you know it might take a little bit longer um, but yeah I I think definitely you know and I think you know RC is promoting what Survivor World Peace. Yes. So, yes. So, Denise, hey, you? she's already on board. So, I think we can get Abby on board. Why not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Kevin Jones wants to know better alliance: you and Malcolm, or Corinne and Malcolm? Oh, I, th- hmm. I think Malcolm would have been uh, better off with me because I think I think honestly because I think because of the loyalty piece, I think Corinne is. I think Corinne. Corinne has bigger cojones than me. I think she's <laughs> going to be more are? willing to cut his throat sooner oh. um, if needed. Yeah. Well, I think that something that you did well with Malcolm is that, and unfortunately it doesn't seem like Corinne has been able to do as well. I don't think that anybody was saying on your season, and correct me if I'm wrong, oh, uh, Malcolm and Denise are together all the time. We need to split them up as opposed to, what is it, day seven, and Andrea is saying, oh, Corinne and Malcolm are together all the time. We need to break them up. Exactly. We we were, it was so undercover for us. I mean, we had literally made our alliance you know, on, on a, a path we were always working. Whenever we were talking, we were working and we came back with stuff. We weren't gone long. Um, we didn't spend a great deal of time. We, we tried to make sure that nobody was, was really paying attention to that. I didn't sleep anywhere near Malcolm, you know, before the merge. You know, I slept in between Russell and Roxy. And, you know, so we just really made sure. And, and that was a conscious decision. You know, and even once the merge happened, I didn't. I just kind of, we had like one moment where it was just, are we good? Yep, we're good. And that was it. And for me, that was all I needed. I truly was just trusting my gut that we had a good alliance. And that's what I'm worried about for him with Corinne is that they're already on people's radar screen. I mean, they're already a target. Denise, did you give Malcolm any advice before he went back? You know, I didn't. I I knew he was taking a trip, but no, I, and no, I didn't. Well, how about this? What if you what if you did know that he that he was going back and you were going to give him advice? Uh, what would you have told him? You know, I I think I would have told I would have told him, I would have said you need to learn how to lie and lie to somebody's face if you're going to do this because had he done that to me at the well, had he you know if he gets to the end again and gets into a core alliance with somebody and they're just checking with him, are you still with me? He needs to be able to just give them that confirmation, that reassurance, you know, that reassurance would have been worth a million bucks for me. 
and a million bucks in his pocket had he just given me that reassurance. He would have been sitting there with me, and I would have lost, I think. Yeah. Now, do you think that Malcolm was not served by not seeing the Philippines play out before going back? Because I got to think that you, you know, you learn a lot watching the episode that you could not have possibly known uh, just living the show. You don't know what people were saying about you, how the certain things were received. Don't you think it would have been better for Malcolm? And again, who knows how this pl- uh, all plays out? But don't you think that that would? Uh, it's a disadvantage to not have seen your season before you go back and play again? You know, I think it it could be because you're not seeing it or, you know, but on the other hand, you haven't had time to question it too much. And if, and clearly the strategy that he had worked pretty darn well. Mm -hmm. I mean, he got down to that, you know, to the, the final, you know, final four. So, I mean, so part of it also might not be bad because then he hasn't had so much time to re, you know, to rehash too much stuff. And the game's still really fresh. But, yeah, you're right. He hasn't gotten to see, you know, how was he coming off? How was he being perceived? Um, But, you know, clearly he knew, you know, very much, you know, what my relationship or what my alliance with him was was like and what his relationships were in in Tandang with some of those players. So, I don't know. I could go on both sides of that coin. All right. Two last questions for you. Here's from Ron Chan. He wants to know, Denise, as a mental health therapist, do you believe Shamar could benefit from a visit to your office in Iowa, or is he just misunderstood, or is it just cultural? What do you think? Uh, I think I think he could definitely benefit from <laughs> from you know, and and who knows? Maybe that's a part of Shamar's history also. But you know, the, the hard part is, and it's and even with Abby, if we say it's cultural, it's not necessarily cultural, but it is our life and what we bring to the game. And clearly, Shamar has brought, you know, he's got life experiences that, you know, are so different from, you know, many of the players out there, you know, the, the tours of duty, you know, that, and depending on the role that he took on in that. Um, so is he misunderstood? Maybe on some respects, but he also lacks, I mean, he could use some of that therapy to, to gain maybe a little bit of insight on, wow, this is how people are perceiving you and this is how you're impacting people. You know, whether or not you think that's the way you wanted to, you are really having, you know, this significant impact on people and not in a good way. Actually, I've got one more question for you before I get to the last listener question. Sure. How did you end up on Survivor? Did you, uh, were you trying to get on the show for a while? Oh, yeah. I had, well, I had only actually applied one year before. I applied, you know, the, the year I got on and then the year before. But I, had, I mean, I've watched the show since, since the start of it. And so I've just wanted to be on. I mean, I'm tired of screaming at my TV. I'm tired of, I was tired of, you know, thinking that I could play better than people out there, you know, that I might have a different strategy. And so, yeah, so I would just, the luck of the draw, and I think clearly, you know, being, you know, the, a sex therapist in Iowa was probably a little bit helpful mm-hmm. in tweaking the ears of the survivor gods. And, and so, you know, luckily, you know, even, but it obviously didn't tweak them enough the first year, but it tweaked it the second year and, and whatever mix they were looking for. You know, it, it, I hit the lottery. So yeah. it was great. Interesting profession. Always a, uh, does help in your, uh, survivor or any reality TV casting. That's a, that's a big one. <laughs> it does. It's, it's, it's a bit unusual around here. So, you know, and, and clearly, and, you know, and it's, you know, and I, I love what I do. So even in that part, in, in terms of, you know, anything down the road, you know, being able to just talk about that, it's kind of fun to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, I, Denise, I had some questions, uh, uh, more than one, I think, from the listeners. I was like, uh, tell us, tell us the most interesting thing any of your patients have ever told you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I skipped and those. I can't Denise. Yeah, I know. Of confidentiality. Yeah, it's I like, know. Hello. That's why I'm a therapist. And that's why I made it that far on survivors because Malcolm knew I could keep my mouth shut. Right. Um, right. But yeah, no. So unfortunately, I can't share too many quirky stories. But, yeah. but you know, I see a wide range of things and, and a lot of interesting. Um, you know, experiences that clients come in with, but, you know, I really do. I, I love what I do and I love the clients that I work with and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's great work. Okay. One last question. Bradley Craig wants to know for three straight seasons, the smartest and most competitive woman on the Island has won. Who do you Aww. think that is this season? Ooh, smartest. And you know what? Well, and Andrea is, Andrea is definitely showing that. Smart and she's very competitive. So right now, I mean, Andrea's on my radar screen. Sherry is bleeping on it, but right now, in terms of the the favorites, I 
I see Andrea. What about Brenda? We haven't talked Brenda, about my, her you know, lately. I need to see some more of Brenda. I think, you know, behind the scenes, I think in the things that we're seeing, she's very smart. And you know what? Actually, that's true. She's probably, she's playing that smart, quiet. Now I almost want to take back my answer of Andrea, but because she's kind of playing that smart, quiet game. But the, my only worry for Brenda is who is she truly aligning with? Like who is she getting connected with? Because we're just not seeing a ton of that, mm -hmm. that she's kind of in that outskirts fringe group. Yeah, I will and. say for her, she went and, and, you know, she voted with the wrong alliance the first week, but now she went and disappeared. And you can yeah. go and disappear in a 10-person alliance, and we may not even hear her name for three or four episodes. Exactly. And and you just have to, and so on some respects, that might be fine because she's then she's not on anybody's radar screen either. Mm -hmm. She's not making the most noise. She's not leading the charge with anything. But then, you know, this is, again, it's a group of, you know, returnees. And do they start getting nervous about what's she doing, what's she thinking? She's not necessarily aligned with anyone for a loyalty piece. And so I don't know. But so I could go both ways on Brenda. I don't know. I'm just saying that in the spot that she's in right now, and she was and she was my pick. And uh, as as were you the season before. So I've been, I'm on a hot oh. streak. Uh, I will say, you know, it's not a bad spot to be in sort of that in that Sandra spot of the spot where just nobody's talking about you. You're just sort of there. And eventually, you know, if people can forget about you, that's not a bad place to be when everybody's gunning yeah. for the all stars. That's true. And it's it is. It's that as long as it's not me, life's good. Absolutely. Okay. Denise, thank you for coming on. Thank you for being so generous with your time. I know we, we, uh, You're this, welcome. Was, this was a long interview. It was a thrill. It was great. Hey, this is the most excitement that, you know, this 42 year old mom gets on, you know, on a weekly basis. So this was great. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, uh, coming on with us. And I, I hope that at some point in the future, we could do it again. Sounds great. Maybe, may, right. and maybe one day, we'll, maybe one day we'll have oh. Malcolm on, uh, talking about, uh, what does he think of his old friend Denise, uh, back on the show? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. That'd be interesting. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Sounds take care, great, Denise. Rob. Bye. Have a good night. You bet. You too. Bye. All right, everybody. There you have it. That was Denise Stapley joining us here on uh, Rob Has a Podcast, recapping episode number three of Survivor, Caramoan. So at the top of the show today, I let you guys know a little bit about our Reality Game Masters event, which is coming up. Uh, we're getting ready to go and shoot this uh, later on this spring, and we have been uh, getting a lot of support from you guys, and that is uh, very much appreciated. And if you haven't heard at all about it, uh, you probably haven't been listening to too many podcasts, but uh, we are taking some of the strategic minds, the game masters of Big Brother and the game masters of Survivor. These are the people who really knew the game backwards and forwards, not just on the show, but probably before they even got there. These are the people that really love games and we're bringing them together to play in an event and we are doing a Kickstarter and getting a lot of support uh, from you guys, uh, both emotionally and financially. So thank you guys for helping to uh, make this happen. And we are so close to our goal right now of we were trying to raise $5,000 and we are about percentage points away from doing that as I sit here recording this podcast uh, late Thursday night. So thank you guys uh, so much. But uh, even if we exceed our goal, it's like Celebrity Apprentice, uh, we can surpass our goal and uh, fundraise even more and uh, be able to put a better product on the screen for you guys for free uh, this summer, whether you contributed or not to making it happen. So thank you guys very much. And let me throw out another name. We mentioned originally that Stephen Fishback was going to be one of the three Survivor players in the game. Last night, I told you that Matt Hoffman was going to be one of the three Big Brother players in the game. And I'm going to throw out another Big Brother person that's going to be in the game. Uh, he is a good friend of Rob Has a Podcast. He's been on the show many, many times, and he is a uh, really funny guy. And I think you are going to enjoy seeing the uh, risk stylings of the one and only America's player, Eric Stein, is going to get a seat at the table in Reality Game Master. So Fishback, Hoffman, Stein so far are three people named and uh, three people to go. So two more survivors and a big brother are going to be joining us on Reality Game Master. So if you want to see the trailer or see more about what you can do to, uh, if you want to contribute to Reality Game Masters, uh, you can go to Reality Game Masters. 
rob.com and over on robhasawebsite.com I'm really really happy with all of the great content that we've been getting from our bloggers in addition to the podcast that we've been putting up we try to put up a podcast almost every weekday or at least four out of five weekdays to try to get a podcast up for you guys but our bloggers are really killing it right now. We've got a new blog up just about every day. We've got five people blogging Survivor for us. We've got two people blogging Amazing Race for us. And we're going to even have a Celebrity Apprentice blogger that's going to be starting next week. So lots of great stuff. If you can find the blogs on robhasawebsite.com over in the bottom of the page, there's podcasts at the top blogs on the second half of the page so check out all of the great blogs and uh, we love lots of all feedback and discussion coming from you guys on those blogs and it's a lot of fun except for when you guys fight with each other because that is not very fun and please try to avoid doing that uh whenever whenever possible because it's a lot of drama okay now i know a lot of you guys are probably saying at this point all right guy where is nicole we want to hear from her unfortunately i thought nicole was going to be with us here tonight uh, it turns out that she did have to work. I actually thought we, she was going to be canceled and she was going to be here with us on a Thursday. Unfortunately, uh, Nicole's work schedule does not cooperate with her being with us here every Thursday evening. So unfortunately, no Nicole here tonight as we are going to take a listen to your voicemails. But Nicole, uh, knock on wood, will be back with us here next week uh, for the second half of the podcast. So let's turn our attention to what you guys had to say. Every week, I love to get comments from you guys, not just on Twitter, not just on Facebook, not just on robasawebsite.com. I love to hear your voices every week, and there's two ways to do that. You can either go on your computer or your smartphone and type in robhasawebsite.com slash voicemail. Leave us a message right there using the microphone on your computer or your smartphone, and I get that. Or you can call us from any phone. 323-282-RHAP and leave us a voicemail question or comment and we will play the best ones on the show. And we are going to kick off the voicemail segment this week with a voicemail that comes to us from our friend Brian. Uh, Brian in Indy, and he has a question about the tiebreak rules on Survivor. Take it away, Brian. Hey Rob, it's Brian from Indy again. Uh, just calling. Uh, lo- first of all, love the daily content. Keep that up. It's been great so far. Um, first thing I'm going to say is I'm really looking forward to the specialist colon the exercise video. It should be an awesome upcoming video, mm-hmm. I'm sure, coming from Philip sometime soon. Uh, now, as for tonight's episode, I first want to say, is Reynolds the, the greatest carnival game player ever? I mean, beanbags, ring toss, and now rope throw? Why did the fans have anyone else try these challenges? Also, do you think they are combining the reward immunity challenge this early uh, so they can save money and do these amazing builds. The challenges have just been awesome looking so far this season. Finally, my main question, I just was wondering what the rules are in playing an immunity idol in a revote. Uh, since Reynolds didn't play it on the first vote, could he have played it on the second? Um, not saying he would, but just wondering what the rules are and if he could have played it for Hope if he wanted to. Uh, thanks again for the great show. Keep it up. All right, a couple of things there, Brian. So Brian says, uh, is Reynolds the greatest carnival game player in the history of Survivor? Possibly, possibly. I, I would suspect Reynolds has a few la- very large polar bear-sized stuffed animals at his house. Uh, that is entirely possible. He may be taking advantage of the carnies in his free time, so very, it's very good for Reynolds there. As for the second point, are they doing one challenge just to make it a better challenge? I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. It is a budget thing, I think, sometimes. It is cheaper to do one challenge instead of two challenges. And if they're going to do one elaborate challenge, that's possibly. It could be a budget thing. It could be maybe they want to put more time into it. I'd have to say I really did like that challenge. I was really uh, literally biting my nails as the fans and the favorites were closing in throwing that ring toss. Uh, that was a really, really great challenge, and I appreciated it. I, I loved it. I saw some people on Twitter said they didn't like it, but I thought that was a really, really exciting challenge. So then the main point that Brian is asking, can you play the immunity idol on the second tie? So it's a, it was a 3-3-3 three, three, three vote. Could Reynolds, if he wanted to, play give the immunity idol to Hope for the second tiebreaker? And 
Correct me if I'm wrong, people, because you guys might know this better than me. I believe, no, you cannot do that. You can play your idol at the point where Jeff says, hey, does anybody want to play the Hidden Immunity Idol? You play it there, and then that's it. You can't play it after a tie-break vote has already happened because then we're getting back towards where the how the Immunity Idol used to be, where you could play it after the votes were read, and they changed that rule. So, no, you cannot play the Immunity Idol after... It is a tie break. So uh, we did have a a three 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 vote, which was very which was very interesting. You don't see that too often on Survivor. And amazingly, it was a three 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 vote idol flush, except that the idol didn't get flushed. So somehow, uh, maybe had they put Reynolds as one of the two people that they were trying to flush the idol, they would have actually gotten the idol out. But no, they did not even flush out the idol. Yet we had a three 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 tie, which was very interesting. So let's t- go with Michelle next, and she has a question about a potential celebrity survivor. Michelle, hey Rob, big fan of the podcast. My name's Michelle, and I just had a question uh, regarding future Survivor seasons, uh, specifically celebrity Survivor contestants. I read an article online about Jeff Probst saying that he would like to have an all-survivor celebrity cast for one of the seasons. I was just wondering what your thoughts on this were. Uh, I'm actually not really too keen on it, but I would love to hear what you and Stephen Fishback think about this. Thanks. All right, Michelle. Well, I can't tell you what Stephen Fishback has to say, but I have a feeling Stephen Fishback would be very much against a celebrity survivor I don't think we're ever going to have a actual celebrity survivor. I think maybe almost like The Apprentice, where it's like if the survivor ratings ever got so bad that people weren't even interested in a regular survivor, a la The Apprentice, where The Apprentice started to get really boring and nobody really cared about The Apprentice anymore, then we could potentially see like a 12 or 14 day celebrity survivor, which would basically be sort of like, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. I don't think it would be very good. I do think, though, that what we could expect to see is following last season, where we had Jeff Kent and Lisa Welchel on the show last season, I would not be surprised for as long as Survivor goes on to see, okay, here's one or two random people uh, that, that you know, oh, here's oh Dave Coulier is on Survivor this season. Oh, girl, that's cool. Uh, you know, you're gonna have one or two random people show up on these shows, and I think that we will continue. Oh, there's Chad Ochocinco. Okay, he's on Survivor this season, and I think that's a great way to get people in the door. And I think also you get people that watch the season that may not have otherwise watched the season. Like I know for a fact that Lisa Welchel did bring a lot of viewers to Survivor that weren't necessarily Survivor watchers who were people that were fans of Lisa Welchel and it's amazingly that she has a lot of fans and she was very and she was very popular with those people that grew up watching that show. So I would not be surprised if we see more of the Jimmy Johnsons, more of the Jeff Kents, more of the Lisa Welchels. And, uh, you know, who knows who it's going to be next, but I think it's actually a smarter way of doing it, of a little bit of a spice, uh, a little bit of not any of the Spice Girls, maybe, um, but maybe just a little dash of the celebrities on the show in addition to, okay, let's bring in, like, the formula is almost like a it's like you're making meth. You want to have like, uh, let's bring, let's have some 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 crazy people. Let's bring in some returning players. Let's bring in some former celebrities. Let's put it all together, and then you get a good cast. So the Survivor casting department is working out the formula as we speak. Uh, call in Walter White, and they'll get it uh, right for next season. So here we go. Let's go to Brian Spaulding. He's a question about uh, me and Nicole. Hey, Rob, this is Josh Spaulding, and I'm just wondering if uh, Nicole has let you back into the bedroom yet now that your hair is growing back. I see on the shows you're starting to get a little more hair there, and I thought maybe she was getting a little more pleased with you. Hope everything's going well. Thanks for all you do, Rob. It is appreciated. Bye. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. Now, uh, Brian wants to know, has Nicole let me back into the bedroom? 
Uh, I will say that Nicole did not carry through with her promise after I shaved my head to fit, that I would be sleeping on the couch for months. That actually did not happen. I did not ever have. I don't even think I slept on the couch once uh, because of the uh, hair shaving bald gate that we went through when I won the podcast award. Of course, I said I would shave my head if you guys would vote for me, and you guys lived up to your end of the bargain, so I, as well, lived up to my end of the bargain. Now, Nicole never did make me physically leave the room, but I will not, I will, I will not say that she is as pleased with me to this point as she was pre-head shaving. So, uh, yes, the I will not say that I am back on the same footing that I once was pre-head shaving, but I am I am physically in the room. So uh, we'll go we'll we'll uh, we'll just leave leave it at that, Brian Spaulding. So we have another question. This comes to us from William, uh, who has a question about last week's show. Yeah, hey Rob, uh, this is William, and I just had a, a quick uh, question for you. Uh, I love that uh, music clip that you played last week of BP uh, her song. But I don't know well, where I can uh, find the whole thing because I really want to check that out. Uh, so thanks for uh, sharing that. And also, I just wanted to say that I thought that the exit interview today with Hope was really great. I felt like you guys had some uh, pretty cool uh, chemistry. I thought maybe she might have been hitting on you. So uh, let me know what you think about that. And uh, thanks, man. Bye. All right, that was William. Great job by William, uh, really. And he enjoyed the exit interview today with Hope. I tell you, I thought that was a good one. All right, so he wants to know, he really liked the song that we played last week uh, by Lisi. Uh, of course, we're referring to this song. Yes, the Tidy Whities. Take it away, Lisi. This is my tidy favorite song. Whities. Tidy Whities, little boy, Tidy Whities. Tidy Whities, little boy. And of course, uh, the now a lot of people have asked me. I got this a lot on Twitter. Got this a lot on uh, the comments. Rob, I can't find this video. Can you help me out? And you know, I do feel a little bad, uh, like passing the link around to this. It's a little bit like how you must feel if you're passing around the tape in the ring to somebody else. Uh, but this is uh, what I do, and so I have made a easy to get to link. If you ever want to hear this. Hi. So uh, the link, if you ever want to hear that uh, in, in a pinch and you don't have time to look it up on YouTube, you could just go to robhasawebsite.com slash Lisi, L-I-S-I, robhasawebsite.com slash Lisi, uh, and that takes you directly to this. Tidy whitey's little boy. <laughs> By the way, uh, I'm very impressed with you, with the curiosity of you guys because at the point last week where we did this podcast, one week ago tonight, uh, this video that I'm pointing to had t- about 2,800 views, and one week later, uh, this video is now sitting at 3,576 views. <laughs> so I have to imagine that we attributed, the, the listeners of this podcast attributed about 700 video views of this. <laughs> and again, uh, parental discretion is very strongly advised. Uh, NSFW to the max for uh, Lisey's Tidy Whitey's videos. And uh, somebody brought this up last week and said that Lisey is the, was the worst player of all time. And I say that the worst Survivor player of all time would not be capable of such music, musical genius and uh, outstanding video making. So absolutely not. Lisi is not the worst player of all time. So thank you very much for that call. William, we have one last call. This is from uh, Robert in New England. Hey, shout ahead. It's me, Boston Rob. A lot of people in your comments are saying, I'm not the best survivor player ever. They're just mad they can't get a girl as hot as Amber. My question is, who do you think is playing the best game so far? Boston Rob out. Wow. Oh, my goodness. The Boston Rob calling up and leaving us a voicemail. Uh, I don't know. I thought Boston Rob sounded a little bit like John Travolta there. Let me see. If, let me hear that again. Hey, shout ahead. It's me, Boston Rob. A lot of people in your comments are saying, I'm not the best survivor player ever. 
They're just mad. They can't get a girl as hot as Amber. Yeah, Boston Rob starting to <laughs> starting to lose his accent a little bit there. I don't know what what happened. They said, "I'm not the best survivor player ever." Uh, so yeah, not <laughs> not a great job by there by uh, Boston Rob doing his own voice, uh, but. Uh, who is the best Survivor player ever this season? Okay, well, first, let me take this in two parts. Okay. Yeah, I have been getting a lot of flack on the comments on robasawebsite.com from people. All of a sudden now, I am a uh, a Boston Rob fanboy, according to a lot of the listeners of this podcast, which I find this very hard to believe that all of a sudden that I'm like a... Uh, that, how am I, of all people, now I'm a Boston Rob, uh, not just a a Boston Rob, uh, you know, approve approver, but now I'm a Boston Rob lover, of all people. Um, I have to say that I think Boston Rob is a great is a great Survivor player. I think he has he has flaws, but I think he, that he, as a Survivor player, he has gotten better over four times. I think part of the reason why he's also so great at Survivor is that I think he was very raw when he was younger, and I think that over play, playing the game over a hundred days, I think he really fine tuned uh, his his tools as a Survivor player. So I do think he is the best player but I also think he's played the most times and I don't think that that's a coincidence that as you play the game more you get better and you get more experience and so uh, I don't think that that's a crazy thing to say that Boston Rob uh, is the best player ever and there's other great players of the game and I think if they played the game as much as Boston Rob played that they would have a chance to have as much experience and be as good as Boston Rob is about the game Um, but I've read, you know, there's, there's a lot of crazy uh, conspiracy theories that I've read. That I've read that this week that Rob is only Rob is is kissing up to Boston Rob because Jeff Probst loves Boston Rob, and that's how that's my plan to get back on Survivor, which is which is really like tinfoil hat time, where like Jeff Probst gives a, a you know what who I think is a good player. And like that is what's gonna get me back on Survivor. That Jeff Probst is saying there, you know, Sester Nino, uh, he's got a good opinion about Boston Rob. Let's get him. Let's get him back. We weren't gonna call him, but he's. I've heard he's said some nice things about Boston Rob, and you know, I do love me some Boston Rob. So let's bring let's bring him back on the show now. Like that's. Um, I I would not tell you my an opinion on something unless I believed it. I am not. There is no ulterior motive for saying that Boston Rob is a good player, and it's not a crazy thing to say. And uh, yeah, we've been talking a lot about Boston Rob this season, but you have Philip on the show this season, who's talking about every five seconds he's on the screen about the BR rules, and then you have Sherry on the other tribe talking about Shamar is her Philip, and then you have a bunch of other people who played with Boston Rob, uh, like Andrea. Well, not a bunch of other people because now Francesca's gone too. But, you know, he's been on the sh- there's four seasons of the show. There's only uh, 26 seasons of the show. So he's going to come up from time to time. So there's no ulterior motive on the Boston Rob. And uh, But, you know, if saying good things about Boston Rob is going to get him to call in and leave us voicemails on the show, then uh, so be it. And uh, so th- there you have it. And then back to the other part of Boston Rob's original question, who is playing the best game this season? This is a very tough question to answer, and I'd actually like to see this in the comments from you guys. Who do you guys think is playing the best game? Because I don't think there's anybody that's playing a flawless game. If you would have asked me last week, I think I would have said Sherry, but I think that the Shamar thing has gone on too far. I would have to say, I would have to go back to... Uh, maybe you might say a guy like Matt might be playing the best game because he's uh, doing a good job of keeping his nose clean over there. Matt and Mike, I think, are in a pretty good spot over there at the Fans Tribe. But I would have to go with one of the favorites. And I think I would say... Uh, I, I think I would say Cochran. I, I think so. And, and not that he's done anything that's particularly impressive, but... You know, he's done enough that nobody is saying to vote him out. He seems to be in with every single person, almost like what Denise was saying, that he seems to have a relationship with. He's got He's in good with Philip. He's in good with Brandon. He's in good with Andrea. He's in good with Corinne. He's in good with Dawn. Uh, You would imagine that he's probably in good with Eric Reichenbach. So he just has all of the tentacles out there. I think he is in a position to... If the plan strikes him, that he could do whatever he wanted to do 
in the game if the mood <laughs> struck him, if he had the idea. I just think to this point in his Survivor playing history, we have not seen Cochran yet make the, I don't want to say the big move, because he did he did make a big move, but I don't think that was a big move that he came up with. It was a big move that he was coerced into. I don't. I would love to see Cochran now. He has all these relationships. I would love to see Cochran make his move that he needs to make to further himself as opposed to help advance somebody else in the game by doing what he what they want him to do. So I'll say Cochran, I think, is playing the best game so far, but he needs to show me something soon. And otherwise, I don't think it's an easy question. I think that it is a tough one to figure out who's playing the best game so far, because I think so far I've seen a lot of flaws from a lot of players. So those are the voicemails. And uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, every week, you can leave us your voicemails, robinswebsite.com slash voicemail, or call us at 323 282 R-H-A-P. So I want to take a few, uh, let's check in on Twitter from what the other survivors are saying. A slow week. We really, uh, you know, things went nuts the first week. I have a feeling that when the favorites go to tribal council, those are going to be the really wild weeks on social media as opposed to the weeks where the fans go to tribal council, and those are pretty calm on social media. So we'll see what happens if and when the favorites go back to tribal council. Just a couple of tweets to mention here from uh, Ali Pohovitz. Uh, at Ali Pohovitz, she tweets, I'd give a minimum three fingers to go back into the game. Definitely quit. Good call. So she was. she's not a Shamar fan to begin with. I would imagine that she was probably on the no-talking list. Um, in when she was in the game, uh, it's funny after we talked to Kathy Sleckman, if you listen to the fans versus favorites podcast we did earlier in the week, she's got a good story about cutting fingers off, uh, to get out of the game. Uh, so Allie would cut the fingers off to go back into the game. So, uh, there's a good yin and a yang there for our two fans versus favorite seasons. Uh, Michael Snow, he was very nice on Twitter at Hey Snowy. He tweeted to uh, a new person on Twitter, uh, at Survivor Eddie. Now, I think that's the rookie move here when you're on the show and then you come on Twitter and then you do the at Survivor. You know, we've seen it many times between whether it's a, a Survivor John or a Survivor Penner or, or, or a Survivor Marty. Um, actually, I'm not sure. I don't think there was a Survivor. I don't think there was ever a Survivor Penner. That may be wrong, but Survivor Cochran, whatever. Uh, I think that's the rookie move. So at Survivor Eddie, he says, uh, sorry to, to, to Survivor Eddie, he says, sorry to vote off the best looking girl on the island. So that was nice, at least, of uh, Michael Snow to apologize. And here's one from uh, Russell Hance. This isn't so much about Survivor, but the interns uh, found this. And this was from uh, Brandon Donlin, our head of interns, uh, oversaw the operation this week. This is from Russell Hance. Uh, he tweeted, uh, let me ask you a question. If you're not gay... Why the F do you want to Skype with me? Hashtag stop. Hashtag please. Hashtag weird. So uh, apparently there's a lot of heterosexual guys that are trying to Skype with uh, Russell Hance. I mean, why not? I mean, who wouldn't want to pick Russell Hance's brain uh, for a little bit? I'm sure that would be a very interesting Skype call uh, to have with Russell Hance. Uh, so uh, apparently if you were trying to if you're a heterosexual man and you were trying to have a Skype call with Russell Hance I guess you know now his opinion on that so there you have it all right so I'm gonna wrap it up here so uh thank you guys uh, so much this was a lot of fun here tonight we've got a lot of podcasting coming up in the next couple of days I'm going to check in with our big brother chief correspondent our number one rehab porter on the scene. Uh, he is following Big Brother Canada extremely closely, and I will be talking with Brian Lynch either uh, either Friday afternoon or Saturday, and I'll have that podcast up for you. We will discuss the first two nights of Big Brother Canada. I watched the premiere of Big Brother Canada on Wednesday night. I have to say I thought it was good. I was into the Big Brother Canada. I thought they did a very good job, and uh, I know that Dan Geesling was supposed to be on the on the show on Thursday, so I definitely want to check out the live eviction show from Big Brother Canada, and Brian Lynch is following the Big Brother Canada live feeds, so we will uh, check that out all over the weekend. Then, Sunday night, it's time for The Amazing Race to come back. I'll have an Amazing Race podcast uh, for you guys 
on Sunday night. And then The Celebrity Apprentice is premiering as well this upcoming Sunday night. So I will check out The Celebrity Apprentice and then I will record a Celebrity Apprentice premiere podcast on Monday. And then we'll do it all again next week because uh, that's what we do here. That's what we do here. We watch TV and then I talk about it and uh, we have a good laugh. And then uh, you guys tell me what you think. And then uh, we just keep doing it over and over again. It's Groundhog's Day. But it's a lot of fun, and I love to do it. And I hope you guys uh, enjoy listening to it uh, nearly as much as I love making these shows. So thank you guys so much for your support. I uh, had a lot of fun with Denise. Uh, hopefully we'll be back with Nicole next week for you guys. And that being said, if you liked what you heard here tonight or on any of our shows, we always appreciate the feedback on iTunes. If you want to give us five stars and leave us a comment, that's uh, pretty good. And keep in touch with us on Twitter. Send me your tweets at Rob Sesternino. I try to write back uh, to as many as I can, and I always love to hear from you guys. So have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Bye.